Welcome to Gotta Run with Will. I'm Gary Corbett. I'm a running historian and archivist. We're here today to talk about the New York Pioneer Club, a story that uh, has been uh, overlooked for many years. Uh, history sometimes gets forgotten, ignored, and distorted. Uh, the New York Pioneer Club was started in 1936, co-founded by Joseph Yancey. It's a black uh, athletic club, again, started in Harlem. And we're here to, to set the record straight in terms of just the history of the club and there's also a lead into a New York Historical Society exhibition that starts October 27th that will be uh, it's called Running for Civil Rights, New York Pioneer Club, 1936 to 1976. I'm going to talk a little bit about the club and New York Roadrunners uh, and the sport of long distance running. New York Pioneer Club was one of the most unique clubs in the world. Being an integrated club during the Jim Crow era of segregation, being a club that fielded champion and average runners in track and field, cross country, long distance road running, ultra marathon running, and race walking. The Pioneer Club had a champion race walking team in the late 1950s. It was also a home for Jewish athletes. The, the New York Pioneer Club shall be composed of athletes regardless of race, color, or creed, or national origin. And from that time, we became a United Nations organization. In fact, we spearheaded the interracial movement in sports. This was about uh, four or five years before Jackie Robinson uh, entered the big leagues. New York Roadrunners was started in 1958. It was then called Roadrunners Club New York Association. It was uh, co-founded by my father, Ted Corbett, and uh, John Sterner. There would not have been a New York Roadrunners Club in 1958 without the New York Pioneer Club. The initial 47 members, nearly half were New York Pioneer Club members. First four presidents of the New York Roadrunners were New York Pioneer Club members. The birthplace of New York Roadrunners was in the Bronx, and we're going to talk about the, uh, the, the course there, the Holland River course at McCombs Dam Park and Yankee Stadium. Uh, just, just briefly about the sport back then, it was a small sport. A large race would be 35 to 50 runners. But everybody ran fast. If you're in a four mile or five mile race, most of the field was under six minute pace. In that era of the 50s and 60s, the official cutoff time for a marathon was four hours. Uh, you, you still keep running, but you wouldn't be official finisher in a, in a lot of cases. And the sport was still small relatively in the early 70s. Uh, New York Roadrunners had, still hadn't crested 300 members uh, as, as, as late as the early 1970s. Uh, what, I'm, uh, what I want to do now is uh, introduce uh, my three guests. Uh, Valerie, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be looking to you to, to give the culture of the club. And uh, uh, Mitchell Strong, Valerie Levy and Mitchell Strong, both Mitchell and I saw the sport as children. I was 10 years old in 1961, and I knew everybody in the club, New York Roadrunners Club. Uh, Mitchell saw the sport uh, as, a, as a young child at the McCombs course in the Bronx. And Frank Handelman, uh, our other panelist, was, uh, was very, he was, he was on the scene running races when the Bronx era of running was closing. And then he was there when the Central Park era closed. So again, the birthplace was in the Bronx, and now you know Central Park. It's been there for, for quite a few years. But those early years, that first generation was uh, was in the Bronx. So Valerie, now Valerie's his husband was Ed, Ed Levy. The wheels to the New York Pioneer Club was Ed Levy as an assistant coach and manager, and Joseph Yancey the coach. Talk about your first introduction to the New York Pioneer Club in 1952. Huh. It was a wonderful introduction, but a bit odd. I had met Ed um, about a month earlier. It was in um, February that I was introduced to the New York Pioneer Club. Ed asked me out on a date. And the date was the track meet, it was the uh, Milrose Games at Madison Square Garden on um, 8th Avenue and, and 49th Street. Um, it was an interesting date because 
I was sitting up in the stands in Madison Square Garden and my date was down on the field in a tuxedo with a starter's pistol in his hand. Um, so for, for most of the date I was watching, I didn't have a clue as to what I was looking at, but he would come up out of the sta out off the field every once in a while to make sure I was okay. That's how I was introduced to the New York Pioneer Club from that day until now, sitting here with the three of you, it has been a marvelous journey, an educational journey, and certainly a very interesting one. Ed Levy became manager of the Pioneer Club in the mid-1940s at age 16. Tell me how that came about. He was 16 years old, and prior to him reaching his 16th birthday, he had tried to run track because all of his many buddies in the Bronx, he grew up in the South Bronx, mm -hmm. were running. Uh, and they were running for the Pioneer Club. Um, when he was seven years old, he um, fell and fractured his hip in his mother's kitchen and developed osteomyelitis as a result. They did not have the specialized medicine in those days. And he, um, one of his legs was shorter than the other. That he, he had a very pronounced limp, so he couldn't run. So he turned his interests in other means, in other ways to the club. And Joe saw that he was absolutely dedicated at 16. And at that point, made him the manager. And Joe said that it was very beneficial because then he could turn his attention to coaching and the administrative pieces and the pencil and paperwork he left to Ed. And they never looked back as a team working together. Oh, it's, it's a remarkable legacy, remarkable legacy. Well, we talk about the culture of the club. Uh, Mr. Yancey's his, his life lessons that he would impart on the team members. And uh, just talk, talk people through that. Well, Joe, as the coach, to me, he was always remarkable. Um, he, and he never swerved in any of his pronouncements, his requests, or demands, if you will. His famous um, uh, dictum to his athletes was, you are a gentleman first, and an athlete second. And from there flowed everything that the team members learned from him, even down to table manners and the manner in which they would dress, going to meets either outside of the city or even out of the country. I want you to know, and the two of you may know, Joe insisted that they wear a tie with their shirt. And up until the last days of Ed's coaching, he always had a spare tie in his jacket pocket for anyone who claimed they didn't have one or they forgot one. There was never a question as to how you were going to look and how you were going to behave as a member of that team. They were truly gentlemen first. You know, one thing I failed to say in introducing the, the, the Roadrunners Club is this is all volunteer. Uh, this, there, there was no prize money for the top athletes and the race officials and administrators were all volunteer work. And I, I went to all the races during the 1960s and, and, and Ed, Ed Levy and Joseph Yancey were always at the races as were, were the other Melrose coaches and advisors and all. So it's, uh, but that's, that's important to understand the area. This is a volunteer. It's very important. You know, talk about Ed, Ed Levy, the man. The, 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 uh, just what, what his, char his characteristics as, as, as you. Oh, his character? Well, there's something that the three of you may not know. Ed had two wives. He certainly did. <laughs> Track and field and me. And please don't ask me to put them in a particular order. <laughs> that would be difficult. 
Um, I'm pleased to say that he never um, diluted his passion for track and field to please me. Uh, he knew that I would prefer that he stay at home on some of those four nights a week that he was up at the armory uh, doing track practice or at McCombs Park when the weather permitted. But it paid off. The, 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 the team was successful. He was proud of what he was doing. I'm not a psychologist, but in, in, in my opinion, it strengthened him to know that he was helping others. The club was so successful, and as, 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 we, tell, as, as we tell this story, and uh, it, there's, there's prices to pay sometimes with that. But uh, talk about also with, with Ed in terms of his impact globally in the sport. That's very interesting. His talent as an influencer on athletes certainly reached others, and the administration of track and field would call on him to take teams abroad, um, clinics, they called them, to help uh, other countries, smaller countries, develop their interest and their ability in the sport. In the late 60s, when there were many African countries, small ones, gaining independence, they were interested in strengthening their skills so that they could compete in the 68 Olympics in Mexico. And he took teams to, to those countries. And he told me about the time they went to Abidjan uh, in the Cote d'Ivoire. And the menus were passed around in the restaurant. And one athlete, when it came his turn to order, said, I'll have a hamburger, Ed said in his own way, didn't say these words were not today. <laughs> no, no, you are in the Paris of Africa. You're not going to order a hamburger. But he took it as a moment to share the opportunity for the athletes to learn a different culture, a different cuisine, and how that might help them in, in the future. Other smaller countries in Africa were so appreciative of the uh, coaching techniques, uh, the administrative techniques, and it really did help them. Now, also, he is credited with strengthening the development of track and field in the Caribbean. When we went to Barbados many, many years ago, they were starting track meets with rifles, and he assisted them because, you know, bringing a gun into any country is uh, a major um, uh, task. But he assisted them in how to order a starter's pistol from whom, how to do the paperwork. And there were at least two occasions where he carried the guns in himself. He had to give them in those days to the pilot with the paperwork and so on. He also impressed upon them the importance of the proper gear to wear because many of the children back then were running barefoot. Not that it was some kind of um, a backward thing. I'm not saying that at all. It was a cultural thing. They ran barefoot. Mm -hmm. But he explained the importance of the proper footwear and the, and the manner in which footwear can improve a, um, a performer's um, uh, an athlete's performance. Mm -hmm. He also helped show them how to link with other regions, with other countries, in applying to participate in games in their particular areas. That's very important. If you don't know how to move out and link up, mm -hmm. uh, it's difficult to progress. should be noted also that uh, Joseph Yancey uh, was uh very globally involved with this. Oh, even more so than Ed, no, no question. Yeah, yeah. Again, tremendous, tremendous legacy. Thank you. Mitchell Strong, I, I'd like to, uh, you to talk about how you got introduced to the sport. Wow. My dad was a fan of track and field. At 10 years old, I went to McCombs. Uh, now, that would be 1958. 
My dad took me to McCoon's and the Yankee Stadium and said, we're going to watch runners. And I watched runners and I saw uh, Joe Yancey. I saw the Pioneer Club and I saw a lot of runners. I was not terribly impressed at 10, but it was my first introduction. And on the weekends, he would drag me to those meets. Uh, then I had an uncle who was training for the police academy. And he would take me to McCombs and start to run. And he also ran for New York Pioneer Club. So it made me uh, attached to the club from an early age. I didn't appreciate it until I became a teenager and started running track. I said, my God, I was coming here at an early age. And then, of course, I saw your dad, Ted Corbett, again, at, Ted, at 10 years old. And at 10 years old, it didn't mean much. But boy, at 16, he was a hero of mine. And it, it, it meant everything to me as uh, to know this gentleman and to know of him. Now, of course, I wouldn't approach him because, uh, you know, it's like I was, get the, get the little kid away from me. But at 16, you envy people who are very, very good. And Ted was very, very good. He was a hero of mine. He was starting to become a hero of mine. I want, to, I want you to talk about this, your search for finding a, a running club to compete that was, with. That was very interesting. I white ran track in high school, went into the Air Force in 1966, came out of the Air Force about 20 pounds heavier, and then never ran again. Uh, about five or six years later, I decided that, well, you know, I was fat and I'm going to start running. And I started jogging. And then in 1977, I watched New York City Marathon. I think it was the first or second year that it came off the, or out of Central Park and onto the streets. My dad, of course, said, let's go to the 20 mile mark and watch this. In my heart of hearts, I said, next year, I'm going to do this. I'm going to run this. And I started jogging, started running. And in this winter of 1977, I was given my first race application by a gentleman named Lon Wilson. He gave me the race application, and it was the Winter Series A, six mile and 10 mile. That was my very first race, six mile. The next month, you had the Winter Series B, six and 10 miles again. And looking at the results, we used to do the awards and the hot chocolate. And I don't know if we had bagels at that time, but the hot chocolate was at the Church of the Heavenly Rest. And I looked at the uh, clubs, and there was a club named New York AA. And I said, I'd like to join that club. But when I t went to speak to the coach, the coach asked me, what was your time at the uh, six miler? I said, ah, it was 46. He said, ah, that's too slow. And he said, I think you should find another club. <laughs> and I couldn't comprehend that because I had been a member in high school of New York Pioneer Club that had Olympians on the team. And Joe Yancey welcomed me, and I was an average runner. I don't think I ever cracked uh, 204 at that time for a half mile. And he welcomed me with open arms. I couldn't understand how a club would look at you and say, I think you should find another club. Well, of course, I ultimately did find another club, and that was in Van Cortland Track Club. This is important because uh, the Pioneer Club welcomed everybody. You didn't have to be a, a champion. You could be the slowest person in the land. Joe Yancey, Ed Levy welcomed you. Uh, and that's, 
that inclusiveness is what the sport uh, enjoys today with the, the marathon craze worldwide. That culture started with the New York Pioneer Club uh, in 1942 when the Pioneer Club changed its constitution and, and, and became open and uh, uh, welcomed everybody. The club we're referencing to, Bob Glover was the coach. Bob Glover has done a tremendous job for the sport. He's a successful coach and author and so forth. But he was in, in the top athletes, and uh, that's, that's, that was his way of doing it. So, but I, I, that story speaks volumes to what the, uh, what the Pioneer Club was all about. Coach Yancey, Ed Levy, because I, I always can picture them, the two of them standing at the end of McCoon's, right on the 161st Street side. I, I can still picture it right now, Joe Yancey in his hat. And I think he epitomized what my father looked like. Because my father always wore a hat and was always a gentleman. He welcomed with open arms the two of them, said, you will get better, just stick with it. And that's, mm -hmm. how, that's how it moved. And I've, I've heard stories over the years of how he would, at practices, lecture the athletes in terms of uh, just the good manners, the good being men of character. Now that, that's, he built mm -hmm. men of character using athletics. It's, uh, and if you have good character, that pushes you to be towards the, towards the goal of success. I will just interject that I remember my years with the Pioneer Club. Once we took a bus, chartered a bus up to Albany to run an indoor meet in some armory in Albany. I think I ran the thousand yard and a relay, and we all had to wear a jacket and ties, even though we got on the bus oh, yes. right in Manhattan. We got off the bus, walked into the armory, jackets and ties. Mm -hmm. As part of this upcoming exhibit, I've put together a list of 26 people I call history makers, first generation New York roadrunners that really invented the sport, many aspects of the sport here in New York. And I shared 26 names. Mitch, you mentioned two individuals that I'd like you to talk about. The first, uh, Kurt Steiner. Your memories of Kurt Steiner. How do I know Kurt Steiner? I didn't know Kurt Steiner as a fantastic runner, in which he was. I knew Kurt Steiner as the person that started many races, especially the cross-country races. And Kurt always gave a lecture about the history of what was going on, the particular race, the event, who was in it, who who ran it in the past, and it was an educational experience to listen to Kurt. Of course, the runners was, come on, Kurt, let's get going, let's get this started. But he gave you that good lecture about the history of what was going on and the people who were running. The family atmosphere of New York Road Runners back then, uh, uh, an example, Kurt Steiner gave my first basketball <laughs> from Kurt Steiner. Another name I wanted to talk about was Harry Murphy. Harry uh, introduced my father to the New York Pioneer Club in 1947. He invited my father to join. Uh, but your memories of Harry Murphy? Harry Murphy was a tall gentleman, and the, the word that I use, he was a gentleman. And he had such an influence on the team, Prospect Park Track Club, that I know of. And people spoke so highly of him. And of course, I didn't run with Prospect Park Track Club. I only saw him, and I saw his relationship with his team and the respect that people had. Now, of course, as an older gentleman today, I, I would like to be in that position that people would respect me the way people respected him. Now, Harry Murphy is another example of a, a name that uh, has gotten lost in history. I've heard other people speak of Harry and this reverence you're giving him. When my father came up with the Five Borough Marathon concept, uh, he had Harry Murphy uh, lay out the Five Borough course. And that, uh, that's part of history that uh, people haven't, uh, they, they, they didn't know it. They know it now, so we're, getting, we're correcting, correcting things uh, over time. Frank Handelman, I want to give you the floor now. Um, you, you competed for two very historic teams, integrated teams. Again, this is during the Jim Crow era of segregation. Uh, talk about your first stint with the U University of Chicago Track Club and Ted Hayden. And, and That's right. I went there after running in college at University of Pittsburgh. I went to Chicago to get a master's in social work. I spent two years there. I wish 
I love Chicago, but I moved to New York after. And I joined the Chicago Track Club right away. Ted Hayden was the coach. He was unbelievable. He had been a social worker, community organizer in Chicago. And somewhere in the early 50s, became the track coach at the U of Chicago undergraduate team and immediately opened the door to all people in Chicago who wanted to run. And there were nothing like the thousands of track clubs there are now. Uh, and the club was integrated from the start. Uh, he also would refuse to close the Chicago facilities. We had a field house with a dirt track that was part of the university campus in those days. And he opened to everybody and the outdoor track when they built a beautiful new all-weather track. Um, in the late 60s, he refused to have any fencing around it. It was all over, open to everybody. And Ted was just the most amazing character you could ever meet. We also, at the Chicago Track Club, I'll honestly say, if I remember it now, had no women in those days. But we trained every day with a team called the Mayor Daly Youth Foundation. Now, I was no fan of Mayor Daly, I would tell you. But the Mayor Daly Youth Foundation was not all black, but mostly young black women and teenage girls, who almost like the Adams Track Club that we had here in Brooklyn with Fred Thompson. Mm -hmm. And they became an international force. And they trained with us every day. So we were part, and Ted coached them alongside their coaches. So we were always, from the beginning, that kind of club. And I could talk a lot more about Chicago Track Club, but mostly Ted Hayden. He would, he would be open to everybody. Like Mitchell said, it wouldn't matter if you were going to go to the Olympics. We had the Olympians. We had a guy named Rick Wolhuter who became an Olympic medalist. A shot putter named Brian Oldfield, who was a crazy madman, but he broke the world record for the shot put. Uh, a lot of very famous athletes, but we also had runners who might run the half mile in those days, not the 800 meters, might run it in two minutes and 10 seconds. He wouldn't care. Mm -hmm. Not just undergraduates, but graduate students, people who were working at jobs, just as many blue collar workers as so-called white collar workers in Chicago. And his practices were always really short and sweet because he knew you had other functions more important, your family, your school, your jobs. So a typical workout with Ted would be, on a Monday evening, would be like four times 200. You'd jog a few bits, you'd stretch, run four 200s, whatever you could run them in. I used to run them maybe 26, 25 in those days, and you're done. So the whole workout would be like 45 minutes because he said, get back to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. He also tolerated me because I spent most of my social work school years doing civil rights and anti-Vietnam War work, organizing, to be quite honest. Mm -hmm. And he knew that track was probably my third priority. I had run well in college, so I ran for his team, and my half mile 800 times was slower then than I ran in college, even though at that age it was supposed to get better. And he would get frustrated, but he would put up with it, and he kept me going all the time because he knew I had other stuff going on. So that, that was Ted's intro. And then when I finished my two years in Chicago, I moved to New York in 69 in July, and he said, join the Pioneer Club. He said, look up Joe Yancey and Ed Levy. They're going to have a two-mile relay you can run with. Well, they didn't. So I joined them as quick as I could, but in those days, you had to sit out about three months, because when you joined a different team, the AAU, which ran everything in New York, was done by Park Row, by City Hall. I forget the officials' names, but they wouldn't let me join the Pioneer Club for three months. And you had to get letters from everybody that you were leaving one team, joining another. So that's when I joined the Pioneers. Yeah, and before we get to the Pioneer Club and you're, you're coming to New York, talk us through uh, the New York AC uh, boycott, indoor track meet, and your involvement with uh, the decision the University of Chicago Track Club had. Yeah, it, well, in 1968, there was a group called the Olympic Committee for Human Rights that I think was started by Harry Edwards, a big sociologist out in Oakland, or Berkeley. And they decided to boycott, although the boycott didn't really go through the 68 Olympics in Mexico City. But we did have a major impact on the track season. In those days, there were indoor track meets everywhere. We ran... I mean, I was a good runner. I wasn't an Olympian, but I ran in the Baltimore Olympic Games, the Chicago Tribune, the Cleveland Knights of Columbus. We ran everywhere besides the Garden. And a big meet in the Garden was the New York AC had a big meet. And again, there only were white runners and no blacks, no Jews. 
Um, I think they didn't even have Catholics much in those days, if any. So we all decided to boycott that meet in the winter of 68 leading up to the Olympics. And Ted Hayden was totally amenable to it. So the U-Chicago team, which was one of the major teams in the country in those days, and our two-mile relay team won the Nationals many years in a row. We boycotted. And I got my team, University of Pittsburgh, where I had just graduated, I got them to boycott. So that led to, you know, their, for better or for worse, the New York Athletic Club meet folded a few years later and became what's called the Olympic Invitational, mm -hmm. which was in the garden for a number of years as well. Right. If I can add, Please. the track community in the city of New York picketed the New York AC's meet that they ran in the garden. It was the a second meet of the season behind the Milrose Games. And they picketed that meet. It really uh, uh, commanded a lot of publicity from the press, uh, everywhere. And from that day until today, the New York AC never ran another track meet. That's correct. You know, all, 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 all our panelists today have, uh, have great stories about the indoor track and field uh, scene that was very robust uh, during this era, during the 1960s. Was. And very cohesive. <laughs> yeah, really was. My, my other story about New York AC was in 73, I won a Met Mile at Randall's Island. And the coach of the New York AC came over to ask me if I would have joined them. And I said, I'll be your second Jewish member. I'm not joining you. Yeah. And I never did. Yeah. So, Frank, you covered a lot of distances, a good range of distance performances and, and doing well at, uh, including uh, running mile relays for the New York Pioneer Club. Uh, talk, us, talk to us about uh, a time where you had a, a tryout at the yeah, that's uh, New York Pioneer Club tryout. At the three I remember nine. it like yesterday. We all trained at the armory at 142nd and 5th, 369th Armory, and they played tennis there during the day. So we couldn't get on there until like 8 or 9 o'clock at night, sometimes 10 o'clock at night, a couple of nights a week. Mm -hmm. And we'd have a mass amount of people training. And in my day, everybody was a sprinter. There was, you know, they, there was no two-mile relay that I thought there would be. So to qualify, I'm pretty sure it was 1970, for the Milrose Games, and then the uh, New York Knights of Columbus was a meet, too, at the Garden. Mm -hmm. We had to have tryouts, and one amazing night... A week or two before Milrose, we had trials of 440 yards on that track, which is a gym floor with painted lines, and there were 56 runners. Mm -hmm. and I, I got there and I thought, in the first eight, we're going to make the team. There was the big relay team for the 4x400 four or 4x4 four in the Milrose, and what they used to call the club and handicap relay club and college, where the first leadoff runner would get like 10 yards or more yards based on your time. So we all ran these trials. I think we ran like five at a time because the track was so tight. And to my shock, I came in sixth. So I was thrilled with myself, to be honest. I made the team. And then I ran the indoor meets, you know, with the Pioneers that year and the next year. Mm -hmm. But that was, I'll, I'll never forget the scene first. They, Joe Yancey set up all the heat sheets. And I don't know what heat I was in, but it was way, you know, down toward the back. And I had been a good 800-meter runner in college, and I could run 400 pretty good. I could run like 50 seconds or a bit faster, but a lot of these guys could run 47s. So I thought, I'm not going to make this, but I did. Talk about the teammates, who you were running against. Well, the, I was close with a guy named Glenn Shane, Glenn. who Mitchell, everybody will know well. He's still a friend, a little older than me, not much. And he was a great 400 runner. Ed Smalls who then became the athletic director at the Armory for quite a while, not anymore. We had Olympians like Vince Matthews. He won the Olympics, I think, in 72, after, mm -hmm. after uh, that year. And a guy named Alfred Daly from Jamaica, I remember, because we had a big influx of people from the islands, from the Caribbean. And Alfred Daly was one of the people there. Yeah. But those are the people I remember the best. Yeah, yeah those are great, great names bring back memories mm -hmm. for all of us very much. Frank, you were again, uh, as, as I introduced you earlier, that you were, you were on the scene running road races uh, at 
in the Bronx at McCombs Dam Park uh, in the last two or three years that races were there, and then when Central Park opened up for races. Why don't you explain the, uh, winter, the winter series uh, the, that Roadrunners would Well, it was, I, I ran track that first year or two at the Pioneers, but in the beginning of 71, I decided I would try my hand at long distance, and I'd never done that, never run a road race. So I started doing those, and the, all the races began at McCombs Dam Park, the old park, before they moved to Yankee Stadium. And there was a little brick clubhouse, not much bigger than this studio, with showers and stuff. And all, all the races started there and went up Cedric Avenue up to NYU on the Heights, Bronx Community College, where they had the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. And I think it was four miles out and back. And cars would be on the road, and we'd be on the sidewalk, and maybe you'd sneak onto the road sometimes. But they told us to run on the sidewalk because it was safer, all the races. And the Winter Series, my first year distance running, you had to run four races, 10, 12, 16, and 20 miles to get an award. Each one was out and back. And every one of those races had about 35 to 45 or 48 people. None, no more, none made 50. Mm -hmm. Everybody knew each other. So when you would get to the clubhouse to change, you'd look around and say, what place are you going to come in? Because you knew everybody, <laughs> right? And it was inevitably pretty true. I missed the first one because I was sick, but then I ran 12, 16, and 20. Mm -hmm. And each one of those, I came in sixth or seventh or seventh or eighth. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. So I came in like fourth in the series, third or fourth in the winter series. Mm -hmm. And my award was a T-shirt. Mm -hmm. There was a purple, it was an orange T-shirt that said New York Roadrunners on the front or Roadrunners Club. And the back, there was a number. My number, I'll never forget, was 423. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. That was the, the race. But you see everybody go back and forth. So there's Ted Corbett. And there's Norb Sander, and there's John Gallup, and there's Vince Chapetta, and then there was Nina Krusik, who was the first woman on the scene. And she would run all these races with a huge smile on her face. I never could get over it. And we used to joke because we all would change in this little locker room and take showers, and we'd have to get out of the shower so Nina could take a shower. So those were the races. We also ran what was called the Bob Preston Memorial, which was 11 laps around the old Yankee Stadium which they swore was exactly five miles, I'm, who knows. <laughs> and, but it was 11 laps, so you know, in that race, depending how fast you were going, you'd be lapping tons of people. I don't know how they kept track of, I think you were on the honor system to stop <laughs> when you've done 11 laps. So that was that venue. The other venue was Van Cortlandt Park. Yeah, you can get away with it because the sport was still small then. So you yeah, had, everybody, you had a chance. literally, there was never a race with as many as 50 people. Yeah. And when I joined the Roadrunners, in 69, I think the roster was 150. Yeah. It was starting to get bigger, but it was 150. You know, one thing I didn't, didn't mention uh, in just laying out the scene of running back uh, uh, when the Roadruns Club started was women were not allowed. The a AAU would not allow women to run with men uh, competitively. And uh, Frank, the, the, the years that we're talking now with Frank, this was the first entry uh, time for women. That's running, right. And there's that famous time. story about the New York City Marathon where Nina and Lynn Blackstone and others yeah. sat down. With the, no, I don't think Kathy was there. Six women. The gun went off because they were supposed to start before the men and they sat down. That was and you know, that changed everything. But in those days when I met Nina, there was no age group awards. There was no money awards. There was virtually no awards, you know, nothing. But everybody ran. Doesn't matter if you were 25 or 50, it would have been the same categories. Mm -hmm. You, uh, you also mentioned when we talked yesterday about uh, a 30-kilometer race at Van Cortlandt Park uh, where you, you ran with my father. I did. And uh, describe that race and the course that, uh, uh, you know, where Van Cortlandt is known for its cross-country, a mecca, mecca of cross-country running. Uh, this was a combination of cross-country and roads, a little bit of everything. I loved it. The force was four and a half miles. I looked it up again, and whatever distance the race was, this was a 30-kilometer in late 71, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I was then 25 or 20, 26, and Ted was twice my age. And I had never run a long distance race, and I was on the Pioneer, so he said, just go with me. Very generous of him. And we stayed together for the first three fourths of the race, and I finally beat him by one place. Mm -hmm. But again, he was twice my age. And the course was, you'd start at the track stadium at Van Cortlandt, which is still there. 
Then you'd run on a paved path around a little lake there. And then there was a long flight of stairs. You had to make a right turn, go up this very long flight of stairs to a road bridge that crossed over the hundred, not the Henry Hudson, I think it was the Marshall Loop Parkway. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you went through a series of backyards and Yonkers. Literally, the race went right through people's backyards, eight or 10 or 12 houses to Central Avenue in Yonkers, made a left turn, went about a mile, and then went into the back hills of Van Cortlandt Park ran the back hills, came out in the flats, all the way to the stadium and did it again. So four and a half miles, that race would have been four of those loops. So it combined road running, hills, a lot of stairs, and the flats. Yeah, yeah. It was great. Van Cortland Park. So you, uh, you're still running, you're still competing. What's your motivation? Keep it going at it. Wow. The motivation is that I figured this way. As long as I'm moving, uh, the Grim Reaper can't catch me. So that's my motivation. It's the love of the sport that keeps me going. And believe me, I am getting old and getting very slow. But I say, what else will I do? I love the sport. It, it comes from my heart. And as long as they have a race and I can compete, I can get a bib, I will... I would run or try to run, walk if I have to. And if it gets to the point where I have to crawl, then I may have to crawl. Glenn Shane's name has come up a couple of times. Uh, talk about what Glenn's role is with Van Cortland Track Club. Well, of course, you know, I shouldn't be sitting here. I said Glenn Shane should be sitting here. But Glenn means a lot to Van Cortland. Uh, there's two other people, Dave King and Ken Ralston. They relate back to the track time and they bring that history of track and field in New York into present day. So it's the history and the connection from New York Pioneer Club, the track scene, and Glenn is a, is a sage. He's a coach at Van Cortland Track Club. He was a longtime member with New York Pioneer Club. He stayed to the bitter end and from a New York Pioneer Club, he came to Van Cortland Track Club. And he's a very active member of Van Cortland Track Club. I got a, about two days ago, I had an hour and a half talk with Glenn, and it meant so much to me to talk to him. You know, I think about the life after uh, athletics with the Pioneer Club, and so many of these individuals have gone on to coaching. Uh, Frank, you're, you're, you're coaching right now. You've coached a number of times. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm now coaching. This is my third year. I'm coaching public middle school girls and boys cross country and track up in northwest Connecticut where I have another house. I live in Brooklyn. I have a place there for many years. And they started a program. They had no sports teams for the public middle school kids. So they started that, and I got hired, and I've had practices this week. I have a, you know, combined from a bunch of local middle schools, cross country and track. I also, I spent one great year, I was a legal aid lawyer after I was a social worker, then went to law school. But I took a year off and I coached at Adelphi for one year in the 70s. And I spent a year coaching at Hunter College. And then four years, I was the head of a big long distance marathon training team for the Road Riders Club called Team for Kids. I was the head coach of that for four crazy insane years, getting up at five in the morning constantly and stuff like that. But I am still running, you know, I ran a Fifth Avenue mile, pathetically slow two weeks ago. Okay. <laughs> My first race in four years since the pandemic. Right, okay, but congratulations. Good for you. You know, Fred Thompson's name came up earlier. He's a, he's a pioneer person who went on to coach and do great things for the Adams Track Club. And uh, so it's, it's just a long list of uh, people, certainly. Uh, Frank, you had mentioned that you were, you were coached by Gordon McKenzie at one time. Right? I was. I was very lucky. I was a legal aid lawyer. After law school, I wanted to be a public defender, criminal defense attorney, where I spent most of my career. And I was a legal aid lawyer in the Bronx. And our office was right up at Yankee, the old Yankee Stadium on Girard Avenue. And I got wind of the fact that Gordon McKenzie, who had been a Pioneer Club early member and was somewhat older than me, and he and his wife, Chris, were both Olympians for the United States. 
and he was an engineer for the city of New York, and he worked in the Bronx Municipal Building where the state Supreme Court was. So I walked into his office and introduced myself, and I got him to be my coach. I was running then with Central Park Track Club, it was later in the 70, late 70s, and I got him to be my coach. For two years, we would meet a couple days a week at the old McCombs Dam track, an old dirt track, but it was great. And he would give me speed workouts. And I was, in those days, I was running the 5,000s. And my, luckily, I got second place in what they call the inaugural Empire State Games up in Syracuse when I was in my 30s in the 5,000 meters. And Gordon was my coach then. And he was just fantastic. You know, yes, he was. You knew Gordon, of course. Well, Gordon is a, another example of the Pioneer Club strength and lure. Gordon, uh, we got into the sport, wanted to uh, be, run a sub four minute mile. And uh, at first he wasn't uh, a top athlete and he uh, approached the New York AC and they declined him. Years later, certainly they went after him, <laughs> being an uh, Olympian and a national champion and American record holder. And he, had, he didn't want any part of the New York AC. Uh, the New York AC today is a different, different uh, uh, club, but back then they uh, they had their 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 ways. You know, it wasn't pretty. It wasn't pretty. I'd like to with this upcoming exhibit. Uh, we're going to have a chance to reach young people with this story, and that's one of the big big pluses of the exhibit. And I'd like for each of you just to you know talk about how this story should be remembered and taught. Well. One of the most important things young people should know, and it's something you mentioned very early on, about the, the Pioneer Club, civil rights, equity, fairness, inclusion, um, and its effect on the global stage. Um, at the United Nations about 10 years ago, there was a panel, and the, 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 the title of this panel was Seeking Global Friendships Through Sport. And one of the panel members was Elliot Denman mm. from the Pioneer Club. Who else was on that panel was Donna De Verona, the swimmer. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember the other two. But the purpose was to show how athletics, and I don't want to confuse that, globally athletics means track and field, but how, the, how sport can bring people together. And if there was any institution who did that, it was the New York Pioneer Club, who never rejected a member because of the color of their skin or the manner in which they worship. That's very, very important. And young people, for them to embrace that spirit and sense of inclusion in whatever they do will be very, very valuable. Um, to this day, the United Nations annually has some type of program that includes athletic competition mm -hmm. as a means of fostering global friendship. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the administration of track and field recognized Ed in that capacity. Um, in 1984, he was uh, an official in the, um, uh, in the Olympic Games, which were held in LA. In 1997, he was chef de mission for um, the World Games in Greece. He was a member of the United States Olympic team in 1996. And to see him walk into that stadium with his red jacket on, and forgive me, Ed, I'm going to tell on you, uh, and the tears streaming down his face as if to say, this is what I dreamed of my whole life. And when they walked past Bill Clinton, I thought he was going to faint, really. <laughs> he was so proud. How did that make you feel? I was crying too. <laughs> I was right there. Mm -hmm. Believe me, I got up out of my seat 
and I ran down to the ledge. You know, security was waving at me. I just ignored them. I was going to say, don't bother me. I'm from the Bronx. You know what happens <laughs> when you mess with people. From the... And I was yelling and screaming at him. Of course, he couldn't hear me. But um, the the stadium, uh, the uh, yeah, the stadium went wild, and he was walking in with his team, and that was an accomplishment, truly. He also served on the doping committee for USA Track and Field, which is the governing body of track and field. And I mention these things to show not only how he was recognized as a contributor to the sport, but how all of that produced a very fine personality to represent the sport of track and field. And you mentioned there were no women. This is interesting. No, not, none of you have mentioned the fact that for many, many decades, there were no females on the, on the at New York Pioneer Club team. Ed brought women abroad after Joe passed away because Joe felt like your former um, coach did. They were a distraction. But the, the women proved to be very, very powerful on the team. One in particular from Venezuela, Isabel Eliashev. She was an excellent performer on the team. And by the way, for young people to understand, yes, there is room for all genders to participate in the field of track and field and to succeed. And that's what I would like young people to take away. Beautiful. Frank? That's a really tough question. I guess what to think most about the Pioneer Club to me, it represented the best about the United States, as flawed as a culture as we have in many ways in the history of our country, because uh, it was totally inclusive. It was welcoming to everybody. I have to say, hearing Valerie talk about Ed Levy, I just have this total feeling of love in my heart. And there was something about Ed's eyes, I'll never forget, the depth of his personality. But to stay with the club, it, it just gave the opportunity to everybody and was really emblematic of the best part of our country's history, it is, which is difficult as our country's racial history is, to be very honest, and as painful right now as it is. The Pioneer Club was phenomenal in that regard. Mm -hmm. And that's what I remember about it well, and the teammates and the events and the running, but it was the spirit and the openness of Ed and Joe Yancey and, and everybody on the club. What's interesting about the uh, New York Pioneer Club and how one should remember. First, we have to look at why was there a need for the New York Pioneer Club? Now, that's kind of a snapshot of history that's at that so time. Important. And what happens is that as the Pioneer Club grew, it's also a reflection of our society. And I would like to say the Pioneer Club was ahead of its time. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Because it showed Absolutely. what our society should be. Yeah. And that's very, very important. Yeah. And I think it's important for our youth to understand that part, that through sport, through athletic, through track and field, you can grow and you can grow a society. And if you take a little snapshot of running clubs, and New York Pioneer Club, you would see how we would like society to be. And that's how I think the, the New York Pioneer Club should be remembered in history. Yeah. Well, I want to thank each of you for your participation today. I, I handpicked you each, because I knew you had unique stories to tell uh, that uh, people needed to, to get this history correct and known uh, this, this, was, this was important. Uh, I'd like to thank also the Manhattan Neighborhood Network for uh, allowing us this time to tell these stories. And uh, thank uh, Will Sanchez for all the work that he's done over the years in preserving the history of the sport. Thank you, Will, for everything you've done. Got to run.
Because I wanted to ask you how you felt after 1996. Uh... To be a champion, you have to be fit. You have to have confidence. You have to have ability. And you have to be, have enough confidence to do the job. And you have to have dedication. All those things are important in order to become a champion.